We are in Hebrews 11 today, starting this new series, and I have one of those things, I enjoy stories, movies, books about time travel. I'm not really a sci-fi guy, but that whole thing always gets me, uh, always hooks me. So if you would, kind of nerd out with me for a minute, imagine that we have a time machine and we're able to go anywhere in history we want. Now imagine we were able to go, for instance, to 1775, right before the revolution, and we're in New England, and we meet some people who are American patriots who are all about, we've got to separate from England, but then we also meet people, a lot of folks don't know this, there were a lot of Americans then who believed that we should stick with King George. He is our king by divine right. God made him our king, so we should obey him. He has the right to to govern our churches, so all these Baptists and Methodists and Puritans and other wild-eyed crazy people who are starting their own churches are just wrong. If the king wants to tax us, he should. If he wants to make us uh, house his red-coated soldiers in our homes, then we should, because he's our king. And if you were there, then you might say, listen, you you may want to rethink your position In light of what's about to happen, you're not going to be happy if you don't change sides right now. Then get into that machine and we go to 1860 to Mississippi, Oxford to be precise, where Ole Miss is. My daughter does, uh, as a hobby, does genealogical work and she's found out that my wife's great-great-great-grandfather, Richard Thacker, was a prominent guy in Oxford, Mississippi, back then in, 18, in the mid-1800s. In fact, there's a, there's a hill outside town to this day that's named after him, Thacker Mountain, they call it. Not really a mountain, but uh, he, he was an interesting guy because he was wealthy and prominent, and he had sons that fought in the Confederacy during the Civil War, but he was a Union man. He believed in the United States. He did not want to secede, and I'm sure that made things interesting in his home, but I think it probably also made things interesting in that community. My guess is if he hadn't been a wealthy and prominent man in that community, he probably would have been run out of town or worse. But if we could go there and we could talk to the people, we'd say, you might want to listen to Mr. Thacker because you need to understand this cause that you're jumping into is a losing cause. It's not going to last even a decade. Slavery's wrong. You need to give up on it. And, and the United States is not only going to stay together, it's going to be the most powerful nation in the world in about 80 years. So you're, 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 you're hooching your wagon to the wrong horse. And then we get into the machine and we, we glide on into the year 2000 where we encounter a friend or a family member or a neighbor who's just about to lo- borrow a whole bunch of money from the bank so he can open a blockbuster video. You see where I'm going, right? We as humans, we have this tendency to hold on to things that are, that are passing away. Instead of, instead of grabbing hold of the things that last, the things that, that never fade. And that's what Hebrews 11 is about. You've probably heard that Hebrews 11 is God's hall of faith. Okay, there are a lot of stories of great men and women through history in the Scriptures in Hebrews 11. But what it really is, it's not an honorary thing. It's the author of Hebrews 11 showing us what it looks like to chase after the unseen things instead of holding on to the things that are dying the things that destroy, the things that will not last. Now, this letter was written, Hebrews is a letter, written in around the year 63 AD, so about 30 years after Jesus. These people were Jewish believers who'd never met Jesus themselves. They knew Him by faith, but not by sight. And they were getting discouraged. Because you think about what it was like to be a Jewish believer in Jesus in that time. You had grown up with certain traditions that had been around for thousands of years that had sustained your people against all kinds of persecution and and threats. I'm talking about the temple in Jerusalem. I'm talking about the priesthood and the sacrifices and the festivals and the feasts that had gone back to the time of Genesis and Exodus. And, and, And these believers had turned away from all of that in order to follow a crucified man who they believed was resurrected. They believed all this by faith. Their friends, their relatives probably thought they were crazy. They may have even been disowned 
some of them by their families. They had lost income. They had suffered. Some of them were getting discouraged. The whole purpose of of Hebrews, you can read behind the lines and tell, is to encourage these people, stay with what lasts. Don't go back to what is fading. See, God knew something that no one else knew back then, and that was just a few years after Hebrews would be written, there'd be a great war between the Israelites and the Romans who had controlled them for about a century. They were, as they were writing this letter, as the man was writing this letter, the, the Israelites in Jerusalem were building a third wall around the city, getting ready for this revolution. They were stockpiling weapons. They were building new technology. And in truth, when the war broke out, they fought Rome like no country had ever fought them before and very nearly won. But in the end, the temple was destroyed. The city was burned to the ground. Thousands upon thousands of people died. It is a horrific story. Jesus foretold it, by the way. If you read Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. He says, when you look out there and you see armies surrounding your city, head to the hills, get as far away as you can. And so when all this happened in 70 AD, the Jewish Christians escaped and went to another city and they were spared, but so many others did not. Don't hold on to what is fading. Hold on to what lasts. And that's the whole context of Hebrews, and that's the context of Hebrews 11. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through this, these first seven verses slowly. We're going to look at three examples of what it looks like to hold on to the things that last, to chase after the unseen things instead of holding on to the things that fade away. And then we'll talk about what it means for us and how we should live today. All right? So verse 1 of Hebrews 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. He defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the confidence in things that you haven't seen yet. When you listen to popular Christian teaching, I'm talking about religious television, religious radio, talking about bestsellers in the Christian bookstores, if that still existed, which it doesn't. But what you hear is a version of faith that's very twisted from the biblical version. It's a version that says, you control God. You tell Him what to do. You have enough faith, then that person you're infatuated with will become your boyfriend or girlfriend. You, uh, you have enough faith, you'll be cured from that disease. You will get that house you want. You will get that job you desire. That's not what we see in the Scriptures. Instead, what we see is that we don't bend God to our will. Faith is when we bend ourselves to His will. When we do His will, even when it puts us out of step with our neighbors. Even when it seems to not pay off in the temporal sense. In the the sense of things that are happening right now. So let's look at these three examples that he mentions. So in verse 4, he talks about the first example, and that's a guy named Abel. You probably know this story. Verse 4 says... By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So Abel's story is found in Genesis chapter 4. He and his brother Cain were the first two children born in human history. I can still remember, although I was very, very little at the time, when my mom first told me this story. She told me bedtime stories out of the Bible. She told me about Cain and Abel, about these two brothers and how Abel grew up to be a shepherd and Cain grew up to be a farmer and tiller of the soil. And one day they both brought sacrifices to offer to God. So Cain brought the the crops from his field and offered them to the Lord. And, and, And Abel brought one of the lambs from his flock and offered it to the Lord. And God accepted Abel's offering, but not Cain's. And even as a little boy, I thought, that's not fair. Why did God do that? And the Bible didn't tell us. And my mom didn't have an answer for me. And my Sunday school teacher didn't know why. And some people say, well, it's because Cain didn't bring him the best of his flock, or his crop. He just bought him his, uh, his leftovers. But the Bible doesn't say that. So this bothered me for years. And then I, I understood after a while, because I grew up to the point where I could read the Bible for myself, And I understood over and over again, the Bible tells us what's acceptable in the sight of God, the worship that he receives with gladness is worship that comes from the right heart. 
See, it used to bother me because I thought, well, does that mean that if this person uh, wears overalls in the church and this other guy wears an Armani suit, that God prefers his worship because he's dressed nicely? Or does God prefer this person's worship because she's able to give a bigger offering than this other person over here? Or uh, is, is God more accepting of of Robert or Nathan uh, because they can sing and I can't. Is that more acceptable to him? And, and the truth is, none of that is what it really comes down to. It's, it's the heart with which you offer it that God cares about. And I'll just give you one example of where I get this. So Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11, prophet Isaiah, quoting God, says, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. And the really curious thing about that is it's just recording the things they were doing at the command of God. God had told them, offer your sacrifices. That's how the ancient people worshiped. It's like as if he stood here today, as if Jesus came in the flesh and said, stop singing, stop giving offerings, stop listening to sermons, just go home. And we'd say, but we're just here because you told us to be. Why? Why didn't God want their worship? He goes on to say, it's because your hands are full of blood. He talks about how Israel at that time had become so corrupt, so lacking in integrity. They'd become a violent society. They'd become a society where the strong preyed upon the weak, where the rich took advantage of the poor, where no one followed God. And they thought they could six days a week do whatever they wanted. And on the Sabbath day, they could come in and offer God this offering of worship. And God would say, okay, we're good. It's like if you're married and you're a man and you ignore your wife most of the time, but the only time you really speak to her, you're, you're yelling at her, you're griping at her. But on Fridays, last day of work, you bring home fresh flowers every week. Guys, I got, I got some news for you. I'm not an expert on marriage, but that's not going to work. Your wife is going to hate those flowers, no matter how pretty they are. She's going to say, save your flowers and just treat me right. And that's what God is saying here. He wants our worship. We need to worship Him, but He will not accept our worship if we don't come with the right heart. So the story of Cain and Abel, I believe, is a story of one man who comes before God with a proud heart and says, God, look at all this grain. Am I a great farmer or what? And another guy who comes before God and says, Lord, I'm giving you the best that I have, but I know that I don't deserve to be in front of you. I need to change. Lord, change me and help me to grow into your image. You are the righteous one. I am not. Here's my heart. Change me and grow me to your glory. That's the heart that God loves. It's when we come into God's house and we're entitled and we're proud and we're self-righteous and we're judging the people beside us or we're judging the people who aren't here. God doesn't want that. You might as well not come. But it's when we come with a repentant heart, a heart that is desperate, a heart that is hungry for him, a heart that just says, I know I'm not what I need to be. That's worship that God loves. And that's what the story of Cain and Abel teaches us. See, Cain had faith in what he could see, the grain he had grown. Abel had faith in what he couldn't see, the man he would become as God blessed him. Okay, so that's the first story. Second story is of a guy we know much less about, a man named Enoch. His story is in verses 5 through 6, or reminded of, we're reminded of his story in verses 5 through 6. It says, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So his story is found in Genesis 5. And Genesis 5, for those of you who haven't read it, is one of those dreaded chapters of the Bible where it just lists names. It just tells this guy's name, and then he had this many kids, and he lived this long, and then he died, and then this guy comes along. Enoch is the seventh person in that list. And here's all we know about Enoch. It says that he lived this long, that he had these kids, and he walked with God, and then he was not because God took him. 
So literally, Enoch is just living on earth like the rest of us, and one day he's gone. He's in the presence of God, and and I'm sure they did the ancient version of a true crime podcast about him for years after, like, what happened to Enoch? But the truth is, God just said, you're not going to have to die. You're going to skip that whole part and come straight to be with me. By the way, one other person in, in the Bible who got to cheat death through the power of God, I will give you five seconds to say it to your neighbor if you know the answer so you can impress them. You ready? Somebody's out there saying it loud so other people can hear, but no, 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 it's it's Elijah. It's Elijah. Yes, Enoch and Elijah, uh, both of them overcame death. Why did Enoch get this incredible blessing? Well, he walked with God, according to Genesis 5. What does that mean? It doesn't mean he believed in God. I'd be willing to bet if I were a betting man, everybody on earth at that time believed in God. No, it's more than that. So as a way of of kind of telling you what I'm talking about, I'm going to go in a direction. I'm going to take a little diversion for a second. So work with me on this. I don't chase many rabbits, but I'm going to chase this one. All right. So American Christianity, modern Christianity, especially ours, is obsessed with celebrity, just like the rest of culture. When we find out that there is a, a famous athlete, a famous movie star, uh, a politician who calls himself a Christian, who claims Christ, we get excited. We want to read their book. We want to travel to wherever they're speaking and listen to them talk. And, and let's face it, sometimes those famous people have something to say about the Lord that is worth listening to. I know I sound really judgmental, but hear me out. Many times, often, what they say is very shallow. What they say is like, no one would be listening to him right now if he hadn't won the Super Bowl or gotten elected or you know, been in that big blockbuster. But we listen to them because we think they're really important. They've become famous. I'll tell you something else. When a pastor achieves some level of fame, when his book sells a million copies or his church blows up in terms of, of, of attendance, or when he has a a big podcast following or a big following on social media, we hang on his every word. When Jesus said, how do you decide who to listen to? How do you decide who to put behind a pulpit and, and you actually let them teach you about spiritual things? It wasn't the size of their following. It wasn't how much money they made. It was, you will judge them by their fruits. You'll judge them by their fruit. You know what the fruit is, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's how, it's how he treats his wife. It's how he acts when someone criticizes him. It's, it's how he talks to people who disagree with him. It's, it's whether he actually gets down off that pulpit and gets his hands dirty once in a while serving others. Those are the kinds of things that you can't observe from afar. So that famous person who has a TV show, that that guy who has 10 jillion followers around the world, you have no idea whether they're genuine. And that's why we act so shocked when they get caught in some scandal and their church blows up in the bad way. And yet, no one ever checked to see if they were worthy of being listened to. See, here's what I want to say. Being gifted is not the same thing as being godly. You can be the first without being the second. We talk about favor. We talk about anointing. No. What God's looking for is faithfulness. What God's looking for is a person who walks with Him, who says, I want to be more like you. And that was Enoch. See, there's no evidence that Enoch had a bunch of money or power or any of the earthly things that people seek after. All he wanted was God and more of it. And God said, then that's what you'll get. Just come on up. Get the reward that everybody else is fighting for. Get it now. If you seek God with all your heart, then you will, you will achieve the, the fulfillment of your fondest dream. That is the promise of God. Give to the Lord the desires of your heart and, and delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Because you've delighted in Him, you'll get him. And that's what Enoch teaches us. 
He wasn't caught up in the things that were passing away. He looked ahead to what lasts forever. Third story is about Noah. We all know the story of Noah, but let's look at what it says in verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became, became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. So interesting how this is laid out. The story of Abel's in Genesis 4. Enoch is in chapter 5. Noah's story is found in Genesis 6 through 9. So it sounds like the author of Hebrews has the scroll of Genesis out in front of him, and he's just going down the list and saying, okay, that guy looked ahead. Okay, that guy lived for the future. Okay, that guy was chasing after God. And that's what Hebrews 11 is. So what about Noah? I don't know. We love this story. We, we tell it to our kids. We put you know, Noah stuff on their, on their baby room. Uh, we don't talk about the fact that thousands of people died in this story. It is a story of salvation, but it's also a story of, of God's uh, wrath against evil. God is, he is not going to let evil win, no matter what. But here's what we don't really pay attention to in the story of Noah. In Genesis, it tells us that Noah was commanded to build this big boat, And it took him decades to do it. Now, is that because Noah was a really slow carpenter? Is it because the the boat came from Ikea and it's really hard to put together? Is it because wood was in short supply? No, there's something else in the Scriptures that you need to see. 2 Peter 2.5 refers to Noah as a preacher of righteousness. What that tells us is that Noah wasn't just building a boat during all those decades. He was going around to every person he could find and telling them, here's what's coming. God's judgment is coming on this world and we deserve it. So now's the time to get right with him. Now's the time to change your ways. Now's the time to get on board, literally get on board with me so you can be saved. See, humanity wasn't very large at that time. The the world wasn't that old. And so it, it was possible for one man to speak to every person on earth. Noah, I believe, talked to every person in those years so that every person who drowned in those floods, when they stood before God in their judgment, they couldn't say, well, God, I didn't know. Just one day I look up and the water's up to my throat. No, they knew. And they did nothing. That's why it says Noah condemned the world by this. Not that he was standing on the deck of his ship saying, drown you suckers. No, he was saying, I have tried I've tried to tell you the way. Now, what do these three stories have in common? What do they they tell us? Here's the sermon in a sentence. These three people obeyed God above all else, even though it put them out of step with everybody they knew. And that's going to be the case for you and me too. Living by faith doesn't mean bending God to your will. It means bending yourself to His will. And sometimes that means you won't have anything in common with the people who are closest to you. And sometimes that means people will think you're nuts. And sometimes people will be frustrated with you because you don't go the direction they're going. And they'll call you all kinds of names and they'll try to talk you out of it. And I just want to give you five totally hypothetical examples of what I'm talking about when I say living for the future, or when I say living in a way that puts you out of step with with everybody else. Think about a teenager who chooses not to chase after the things her friends are chasing after. You know, her friends are, are listening to what they see on social media, what they hear in pop music, what, what their friends say about what it means to be happy and enjoy life when you're a teenager. And she says, yeah, but, but those things don't last. I'm going to build my life on something that lasts. I'm going to, I'm going to chase after Jesus. I'm going to honor my father and mother. I'm going to be compassionate to the kids that everybody else ignores. I'm going to, I'm going to serve others. I'm going to, I'm going to try to grow into a woman of God because that's going to last. That's going to benefit me forever. It's a single man who rejects the idea that somewhere out there is this perfect person, this soulmate, who will make me completely happy if I can and ever just meet her. He says that person doesn't exist. Maybe someday I'll get married, and, and if so, then, then I will be happy in marriage and I'll do my best. But until then, I have a unique opportunity. My, my friends who are married, uh, good for them, but they have to spend a lot of time 
working on their marriage, taking care of their wife, taking care of their kids. I have time to give to God's service that they don't have. As a single man, I have the freedom to say yes to some opportunities and assignments that my married and my parenting friends don't have. So I'm going to do that while I can. Instead of chasing after some mythical person who doesn't exist, and if she did exist, would have nothing to do with me, quite frankly, I am going to pursue God. Then it's a third example. It's a dad who says, you know, it'd be great if my kid made all-stars or became first chair trombone or, you know, made uh, 4.0 or went off to some prestigious college, made a bunch of money and put me in a nice nursing home someday. You know, all that'd be great. But my top priority is going to be doing my best to equip him to follow Christ. I can't choose Jesus for him. He may, he may completely reject everything I try to teach him, but I'm going to clear the way so that that's the most obvious path for him to take. I'm going to show him what it looks like in real life. I'm going to equip him in every way that I can. Because let's face it, I could probably teach him to throw a split-fingered fastball, but that's not going to do him much good when he's 45 and beyond. And it may not do him much good before that. It's number four, it's a young woman who says, I'm making a good salary and sure I'd love to buy a house and a car and the clothes that are just as nice and as expensive as what I see from my coworkers. But my top priority is to lay up treasure in heaven rather than build a little empire down here on earth. So my first thing I'm going to do with the money that God gives me is I'm going to give back 10% to Him. And then I'm going to, even beyond that, look for opportunities to be generous. Uh, and I'll just trust that God's going to provide. And then the fifth example is the retired person who says, I'm just like any other retired guy. I love traveling. I love golf. I love my grandkids. But I have this narrow window of opportunity where I have all this experience, all this wisdom that I've gained over, over hard, hard years, and yet I'm still, for now, sharp of mind and, and vigorous of body. And so in that window, whether it's, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I'm going to serve God. And maybe that means I'm going to go on mission trips that I couldn't do when I was working. Maybe it's going to mean that I'm going to, that I'm going to teach a life group or, or work with teenagers or work with kids. Or maybe I'm, there's a, a cause out in the community that's going to enable me to serve Christ. It's outside of my church, and I'm going to give myself to them. But for doggone sure, I'm going to invest in people younger than me. And I'm going to give myself to that for as long as I can, knowing that my real reward starts the day I close my eyes for the last time here. It's not now. It's then. Now, all of those decisions I just mentioned will make you very out of step with people around you, even people you go to church with. And yet, all of those decisions will be decisions you will cherish for years to come, for eternity to come. Here's the thing. If you want to be on the right side of history, be with Jesus, because he's the one who's the king. If you're on the side of the king, you're on the right side of history. Stick with him. He's the one that lasts. Everything else fades away. You wouldn't go back to Abel and Enoch and Noah and say, hey guys, get with the program. No, you'd say, stay the course. You're doing right. You're going to be so glad you did what you did. Now, nobody in human history ever lived a life more out of step with their fellow man than Jesus of Nazareth. He came into this world, never sinned even once, his own disciples and closest friends couldn't understand him most of the time. And the people who considered themselves the experts in righteousness, they hated his guts. They couldn't understand how someone who claimed to be from God was so happy and so uh, loving all the time when in their eyes righteousness meant being miserable and angry. And then there came that day when Jesus sat down with his closest friends and told them, here's how the story ends. We're going to Jerusalem. When we get there, they're going to arrest me. They're going to turn me over to the Romans. The Romans are going to nail me to a cross, and then I'm going to die. His closest friend said, no, no, that's wrong. That cannot happen. You, you can't do this. It doesn't make any sense. And to be fair to them, it didn't make sense from an earthly standpoint. Aren't you supposed to get better? Aren't you supposed to keep this movement going? I mean, what good would death do when you're able to heal any disease? Why take yourself out of the equation when you've got the words of life and nobody else does? 
Why would you leave? But Jesus wasn't just looking at right now. He wasn't looking at his present moment. From present circumstances, yeah, it made sense to go into Jerusalem, declare himself king, set up an earthly kingdom where anybody could be healed and anybody could hear the good news. But if he'd done that, we'd all still be lost. See, Jesus looked ahead. He looked ahead and saw you. He saw me. He saw millions more like us. And he said, what they need is not a, 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 an earthly ruler. It's not a teacher. It's not a healer. They need a savior. So I'm going to give my life for them. And that's exactly what he did. And that's why we're saved. So here's what I want you to do as we start this series, and we're going to be looking through a whole lot of stories like this between now and the end of June. But for now, I want you to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, show me what it would look like if I began to chase after unseen things, if I began to live for what is to come instead of for what is right now, if I were to chase after the unseen instead of holding on to what is fading away. Can you pray that and just see what God says?